that's the hard thing about theopoetics is that um, people tend to look at theological discourse, I think, um, as something that lives in a particular realm, right? And theopoetics asks theology to intermingle with the creative life and with um, sort of these impulses that all humans have to, to make things, right? So it's a mode of doing something, not necessarily a monolithic, perfected um, style. Does that make sense? Maybe not. I guess style and mode are similar, right? Um, but Theopoetics asks people to approach theo theology or to approach God, right, from a poetic posture. Um, not forgetting the logical posture, but also keeping in mind that uh, the poetic, the creative, the sort of aesthetic values have a major role to play in how God is shaped for all people, right? And that's, um, that's why I think it's so hard for us to define it, because that's really different for everyone with an artistic impulse, just as many as many impulses of um, and styles and aesthetic values that people might have as artists, there are that many kind of approaches to doing theopoetics. And that that becomes complicated. A lot of people don't like that, can't handle that, or 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 find it to just be too fast and loose. I'm not a theologian though. I'm an artist, so I don't I don't find it to be too fast and loose. I find it to be kind of perfect because when I'm in rooms with theologians I <laughs> I tend to go, I get it, I, I know what you're saying, and I've sometimes read things that they're talking about. And, but I always come back to um, th this the way I live my life as an artist doesn't have a logical component necessarily. It, it's not systematized, it's not systematic, right? So I, when I'm talking with a theologian, I hear them and I agree maybe, but I come at it probably from a different place, which is what, which is a theopoetic posture for me, right? So we might be getting at the same thing, doing it differently. And I think the theopoetics people would just say that um, there needs to be space for the people that interact with God this way to have a voice and to help people who maybe interact with God in a more logical way to be open to this other thing that's creative, innate, that poema, that workmanship idea that kind of permeates um, theological discussion today in, in, the art, in the arts. Theopoetics suggests that we're um, best served when we kind of make room for, for beauty, for awe, for um, these things that draw us closer into mystery and not neglect the logics, not neglect the logical mind, but to couple it um, more acutely with a creative mind as well. And that, that becomes part of the process of, of doing theology, uh, of, 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 of living and of um, living and moving and having our being, right? That those two things need to be put together in a way that works for each individual. And it shouldn't be one all the way or the other all the way. Oh, yeah, the Theopoetics is anchored in a process theology. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think Theopoetics is just a, as much about um, artistic practice as it is about the way God shapes, the way God shapes people, right, beings, as it is about the way we, we shape the divine and how we kind of qualify the divine in, in a world that is moving so fast that it changes instantaneously and our linguistics change and our aesthetics change and our vision for what the world is and is becoming changes. And I, I find that process theology, again, 
as much as I love reading theology, um, it's often, it often feels like I'm in a hospital room and not an art gallery. So it's, it's saying things that I find to be true, but it's saying them in a way that I don't always find to be beautiful. And that's what, um, that's, a, that's a larger concern for me, right? Um, I don't necessarily think it should be the largest concern for everyone, but I think it needs to be part of the conversation. And the shaping of God is a beautiful thing. It's not just a logical thing. One of sort of the, the progenitors of liberation theology, um, Ruben Malvez, was a poet and, and a theologian and a philosopher and, a, you know, uh, a, a thinker who thought poetically, right, who articulated himself poetically. And liberation theology is extremely close to his heart, right? I mean, that's, that's his, his theological bent. But he also has this poetic bent that the academy disallowed, um, that didn't quite fit into the, the way academics speak, and the way academics do theology, right? So he just just left. <laughs> He's like, I'm not doing this anymore. And he went his own way, the way a poet or an artist would, right? Instead of playing the game, he changed the game, or desired to change the game. And was, from what I can tell, and I, some, I'm sure someone will know this more than me, who's a much deeper scholar of Alves, that, that he seemed largely unconcerned by um, his exit from the academy. He thought that he was doing, he was, he's a rugged individual that way. He was a poet that way. Um, and he went his own way. So the liberation theology aspect that enters into Alves in particular um, is coupled with this sense of the poetic as a means of witness as a means of seeing the world clearly in a way that gives voice to things that are voiceless within us and gives voice to people without voices. Um, and I think theology can do that, right? But art does that as well. Liturgy does that in the church, right? Um, community organizing does that. Um, it's not just, theology doesn't quite do that. Theology shows us maybe how to do it in a way that we hadn't thought about before. But there's something that comes after, and that's what I think Alves was trying to get at. And that's where I think um, liberation, and that's why liberation is so important to theopoetics, is because the act of poetics or creation, right, is also an act in some ways of liberating oneself. Right. It's interesting because it seems both the poetic form of expression and sort of the, the convictions of the outworking of liberation theology, it seems like they also share that neither of them are really at home in the Western Academy. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's not just the poetics. It's, it's, the, yeah. it's, the, it's the ideas as well. Right? Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely a wandering that both are comfortable with. Um, and I think that's wrapped up in the DNA of them that, that fixing oneself to something isn't necessarily um, helpful or good. Um, you know, Whitman, <laughs> do I contradict myself, right? I'm vast and contain multitudes, right? Uh, the paraphrasing, right? But um, that idea I find in Theopoetics that uh, it's you're, that the the idea of contradiction isn't negative. It's sort of engaging, and and it and it allows us to see um, where there's room for conversation, you know. And it lives it lives in that kind of liminal space where we don't 
quite know what to say or how to say it, but we're going to try as best we can, and then we're going to revise it later, right? Which is an extremely artistic practice, right? And that's the practice of the artist is making and then remaking and then, you know. It was interesting, I went to, um, I went to an exhibit of, of a retrospective of, of Rothko in Houston and um, it was wonderful to get to read about his process, which I'd never read about. So, you know, Rothko does these large scale sort of rectangular paintings that are just color, right? And they're ethereal and kind of eerie and they're really metaphysical paintings. But the way that he got that look was through the, the obviously the play of light and color. The way he thinned the paint, like he'd, so he'd paint the canvas one color and he'd keep thinning it and thinning it and thinning it until it was barely there. Then he'd add another layer and thin it and thin it and thin it again, right? So it's layer upon layer upon layer upon layer to get this effect that is luminous and moving. And I feel like a person with a theopoetic posture looks at that and says, oh, like I totally get the value in adding and then subtracting and then adding and then subtracting and I'm teasing out this thing that I know to be there that I can see but I don't quite know what it looks like and it's probably going to take me most of my life to figure that out. But I want to figure it out in a way that's beautiful. Right? That's the fun part about theopoetics because, it's, and I, again, I'm not a theologian and I'm not as well versed in this, but I don't see that happening generally speaking, um, in theology as a whole, but I do see it happening kind of with a few particular theologians and all of them, I think, are interested in theopoetics. <laughs> they're, they're like, uh, I'm going to name this and then I'm going to rename it and then I'm going to try again. And it's a, a creative process. And as a poet, as a writer, like I, that's, that's, that's totally familiar to me. That idea that I would like sit down when something is done and then like rework on it, and there's a gentle balance, right, to to not overworking it. So um, that's what impresses me about theopoetics most. I think is its humility in that way. And some people, um, I think maybe more conservative theologians, look at it as sort of playing fast and loose. But I don't look at it that way at all. I look at it as sort of the wonderful nature of creating. It's, it's not fast and loose, it's attentive and articulate and specific, um, so.